Hello and welcome everyone to Life Science Across the Globe. My name is Janine Stevens and I am one of the Janelia organizers of this series. Today's event on non-coding RNAs and epigenetics is hosted by the Center for Life Sciences in Beijing. But before we get started, I do want to mention that we will have a brief meet the panelists session immediately following the Q&A. For that, we invite students, postdocs, and others in training positions to stay on the call to ask questions and hear from our panelists on various career-related topics. It really should be a fun conversation, so I hope you'll consider joining us. And now I will turn it over to Professor Wang Shuo O oh from Tsinghua University for some opening remarks on behalf of CLS. Wang Shuo. Thank you. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the Center for Life Sciences, or CLS. This, our center was established at the Tsinghua and the Peking University in the year of 2011. And it is supported by the central government in China. Our mission is to reform education and research, attract talented scientists interested in education, conduct cutting edge research, and nurture the next generation innovators in life sciences. Cooperation is highly encouraged between our two universities. Both undergrad and graduate students can choose courses and mentors from either university, such as uh, anchors faculty members from multiple schools and departments, ranging from biology, chemistry, physics, engineering, psychology to medicine. Say as expect of an independent laboratory to address fundamental questions interna and internationally renowned scientists evaluate the performance of our principal investigators. So the CS funding directors were the structure biologist Yi Gongshi and the neurobiologist Yi Rao, currently the president in two other universities. Last year, two biophysics, Hong Wei Wang and Chao Tang, renewed CS from the central government, becoming our new directors. CS is pleased to be hosting today's life science across the globe event on non-coding RNAs and epigenetics. And I will now turn it over to our moderator. It is heard from the EMBL to get us started. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm really happy to, to see this uh, Life Sciences Across the Globe event uh, happening once more and lots of participants. Very happy to be in China. I'm actually in Heidelberg, but that's okay. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker on this very hot topic of non-coding RNAs and epigenetics. So Professor Tom Cech, Nobel laureate, um, Howard Hughes uh, investigator, and he's at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And he's actually someone who I have huge respect for. And we organized a meeting together not so long ago that I will never forget about marching towards mechanisms in non-coding RNA. So Tom, over to you and really looking forward to Well, thank you very much, Edith. And I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I am uh, going to share my screen now. And is that visible to you all? Yeah, it's visible, it's perfect. Okay, well, perfect. I, I never aim for perfect. I aim for just simply uh, something that is very good. So okay. good, uh, enough. Yeah, good enough. Good enough. Okay. So uh, yes, this is our uh, BioFrontiers Institute building on the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And uh, I would uh, like to talk about my favorite topic, which is the magic of RNA. Now, when I talk about RNA to um, uh, a general audience, I usually start very simple and remind everyone that um, usually RNA is transcribed from DNA and the order of the informational units, the AGC on the RNA would be the same as the AGC on one of the two strands of the, of the DNA. Now, many RNAs are messenger RNAs so the DNA makes a messenger RNA, which encodes a particular protein. A very uh, common uh, example of this that we hear about all the time is the uh, coronavirus, 
uh, the SARS-CoV-2, which of course is an RNA virus. So it doesn't even need the DNA. It just goes from messenger RNA to make a protein such as the spike protein, which is false colored in red uh, on, this, on this picture of the virus. But also the uh, vaccines, the messenger RNA vaccines made by BioNTech, uh, Pfizer, and also by Moderna in Boston uh, are simply using the messenger RNA to encode the spike protein and use it as a vaccine. And so uh, I think this shows that really uh, the DNA isn't even needed in, in many of these cases and the messenger RNA can do it by itself. Now, how about non-coding RNAs? Well, over the last dozen years, we've come to realize that uh, in many organisms and particularly in human, that most human RNAs are not messengers, but they are non-coding. And the remarkable finding has been that if this is the blue is the information content of the genome, that most of that genome is transcribed, not in any one particular cell type. You have to add up the transcriptomes of all of the tissues in the human body. And then you see that much of the DNA is transcribed. And only a very small fraction of this has the codons to make the proteins, okay? So most of this red part is doing something other than being a message. And so the big question for the future of RNA research, in my opinion, is what are all of these non-coding RNA is doing, and they're probably doing uh, a thousand different things we don't know. Here's an example of a non-coding RNA, the CRISPR genome editing system, which cleaves DNA, but it's not as simple as these red scissors. Instead, how does it know where to cut? Well, it carries around a guide RNA, uh, and when that guide RNA can form Watson-Crick base pairs with a portion of the genome, then the Cas9 protein cuts both strands and you get a double-stranded DNA break, the position of which in the genome is guided by the RNA. If you want to hit a different position, you simply change this pink part of the guide RNA and you uh, can redirect this system to a different location. Now, this was of course, the mechanism of this uh, was figured out by uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. We were all delighted uh, to see the Nobel Prize just a few months ago, and particularly in Boulder, because that is where uh, Jennifer Doudna did her postdoctoral work with, with us. So she has a lot of friends here. Now, this is just one of many Nobel Prizes that have been won by non-coding RNAs. I just thought up this slide just for this particular presentation, I don't know if you will appreciate it, but I thought it was sort of fun, that starting with the sequence of transfer RNA, which uh, won Bob Holly the Nobel Prize in 1968, we had catalytic RNAs, RNA splicing, which requires the small nuclear ribonucleoprotein, so that's another non-coding RNA, uh, RNA interference and uh, small interfering RNAs, uh, we're, again, another non-coding RNA, ribosomal RNA, in the structure of the ribosome and showing how it's so essential for the catalysis of protein synthesis in the large subunit of the ribosome. Telomerase RNA um, was uh, discovered by uh, uh, Carol Greider, Liz Blackburn, and they, along with Jack Shostak, uh, shared the Nobel Prize for uh, what is essentially, again, an RNA-driven machine, and then, uh, most recently, the CRISPR genome editing. So uh, let's talk a bit about polycomb repressive complex two. This is a histone methyltransferase that drives epigenetic gene silencing. And since I am the initial speaker, I will take just a moment to ask the question, what do we mean by epigenetic? And so uh, as shown with this uh, calico cat, um, epigenetics is stable inheritance 
of uh, a change without an alteration in the DNA sequence. So you can change phenotype by changing the DNA sequence by mutation, but you can also change it without changing the DNA sequence. And this is above the level of genetics, so it is epigenetic. Uh, for example, the different color of fur on this calico cat is not due to mutations in genes that uh, uh, are responsible for fur color, but instead due to the fact that they reside on the X chromosome. And when one of the two X chromosomes is randomly turned into heterochromatin early in development, which does involve a long non-coding RNA called the exist long non-coding RNA, then that state is remembered in all of the daughter cells. And so you get a big patch of the fur that is all the same color. Now, uh, at a more molecular level, it's the polycomb repressive complexes, number one and number two, both of which are enzymes which covalently modify the histone tails, either by ubiquitination in the case of PRC1 or by adding one, two, and three methyl groups to lysine number 27 on the N-terminal tail of histone H3. And these uh, covalent modifications lead to condensation of the chromatin. We call this uh, facultative heterochromatin, and then the uh, RNA polymerase is denied access to this gene. This is, of course, I'm oversimplifying a little bit because of my 18-minute limit here, but this turns off the gene, and this is critical in uh, embryonic development, for example, epigenetic silencing of the Hox genes. But in cancer, uh, if a tumor stumbles upon a way to, to epigenetically silence a tumor suppressor gene, that is just as good as mutating it. So that will allow a tumor to, to survive. And so pharmaceutical companies have developed anti-silencing drugs to reverse the silencing and therefore free up the tumor suppressors. Now, what was found with PRC2 and RNA by multiple labs, including our own, is that uh, human PRC2 binds a thousands of natural RNAs. Now, how is it possible for a protein complex to have such a large transcriptome? And Xuan Wang in my laboratory uh, figured out that it was because the PRC2 is recognizing a very simple motif that is so common that most natural RNAs will have this motif. All you need are a few stretches of G nucleotides, uh, and then maybe another one with a spacer of different length in between. And the structural context of these little G tracks matters a lot. So if they are in single-stranded RNA, they are recognized by PRC2. If they are in a uh, Watson-Crick base-paired uh, stem of RNA, they are completely not seen. They are ignored by PRC2. And intriguingly, if they form this uh, quadruplex structure, where four different sets of Gs can pair with each other with Hookstein base pairing, this is a particularly high affinity ligand for PRC2. And we think that these do occur in living cells. So the next question became, well, what is it on the PRC2 that is binding the RNA? And this was difficult to figure out because there was no RNA recognition motif, RRM, or other obvious sequence signature of an RNA binding motif. And so Yi Chen Long in my laboratory in a wonderful collaboration with John Rin's laboratory next door, uh, used a combination of hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectroscopy, adding different amounts of RNA and seeing which amino acids were protected and a lot of site-specific mutagenesis and found that several amino acid uh, residues both on this alpha helix in EZH2 and on this flexible loop were at least part of the RNA binding motif. And here I show the G quadruplex RNA at the same scale as the PRC2 complex so that you can see uh, that the RNA 
uh, how the RNA size is compared to the protein size. Now, um, what we sought to do then was to make to take a genetic approach to ask the question: Is the RNA binding really biologically important? Our goal was to make a separation of function mutant of PRC2 that was completely wild type in every aspect except for the RNA binding so that it would make, it would do complex assembly, it would bind DNA and nucleosomes and have its histone methyltransferase activity intact. Well, we were partially able to do this, but the mutant that we made, which had a 10 amino acid change uh, on the surface of the EZH2 subunit, it was a uh, very good at complex formation. You can see the mutant has all of the subunits and it does bind DNA and nucleosomes and it's enzymatically active, but it was only six-fold uh, inhibited in its ability to bind RNA. It wasn't a knockout, okay? So is six-fold going to be enough to see a biological phenotype? Well, Often a two-fold change in biology can make a difference. So we went ahead and used CRISPR genome editing to introduce either the wild type sequence as a control or this 10 amino acid variant into human induced pluripotent stem cells. And we were uh, we always follow two independent clones in case the CRISPR genome editing has some clonal variation. So here are the two wild type clones, the top two rows, and the two mutant clones. And you can see that they all express pluripotency markers such as SOX2 and OCT4. And the EZH2, which was the subunit of PRC2 that we mutated, is expressed at similar amounts and also remains in the nucleus, which is important because that's where it needs to act um, in both the wild type and the mutant clones. So that was encouraging enough that we went ahead and looked then at where the polychrome repressive complex was sitting on the human genome in the wild type versus the mutant. And so if you look at panel F here, you will see in a genome-wide uh, chip seek experiment where we pull down on the EZH2 subunit of PRC2, that if the RNA binding mutant made no difference to chromatin binding, all of the individual genes, the red dots, would be on this diagonal line. But instead, they're quite substantially bent over, and the mutant is not as good at, at uh, binding PRC2 to chromatin as the wild type. And the uh, panel G shows the effect of the histone methyltransferase, the H3K27 trimethyl mark, and it also is, is down, it's defective in the RNA binding mutant. And now let's look at just one of the genes. Uh, we could have looked at many different ones, but the top two rows are the wild type clones. And this is where the EZH2 is located over this NKX2-5 gene, which is a transcription factor involved in heart development. And here is where the uh, repressive chromatin mark is located, again, across the gene. And now you look at the RNA binding mutant, and you see that in the two separate clones, there's reduced occupancy of EZH2, and concomitantly reduced deposition of the H3K27 trimethyl mark. And that was true for all of these genes shown in red, a very similar pattern to what I show here. So um, when we did a gene ontology analysis to look at what kinds of genes were affected, we found something that we hadn't predicted, which was that a lot of the top sets of genes were involved in heart development. And these were all upregulated in the RNA binding mutant. And that at least is the direction that makes sense, right? Because if you inhibit PRC2 from working on chromatin, you are reducing epigenetic silencing. And so you should get an increase in transcription, which is what we saw in all cases. So now, given this hint that there might be something 
um, uh, about heart development that was being affected, we uh, di differentiated these iPSCs into uh, cardiomyocytes. And after, and I'm going to have to, after 11 days of differentiation, now each of these panels is a large piece of a petri dish okay this is this is one millimeter here so we're looking at a uh, not just a single cell but we're looking at many thousands of cells and here's a real-time movie of what the wild type um, IPSCs look like after 11 days of differentiation and I'm a chemist so to see cells beating like a heart on a tissue culture plate, is very cool, okay? And so here's the second clone and it's beating and here's the mutants and they're not doing much. So this makes a lot of difference to for PRC2 not to be able to bind RNA. Now that uh, you can say, well, how about an unbiased experiment? And so we were able to look at randomly chosen sections of this Petri dish uh, using some software that we uh, obtained from Hupsch. And uh, the orange means that these are beating foci. And you can see that in these random parts of the Petri dish that the wild type clones pretty much have beating foci and the mutant ones do have some, but they're very small and they're rather rare. So there's a big difference. And we can look at a molecular marker of cardiomyocyte development, which is cardiac troponin T, which is nicely expressed uh, starting at eight days of differentiation, more expressed at day 12 in the two wild type clones and very poorly expressed in the two mutant clones. Now, can we test this idea that RNA binding is important for PRC2 recruitment to chromatin? Can we test it from the RNA viewpoint instead of from the protein standpoint? And this was an experiment that was thought up and performed by an undergraduate student in my laboratory, Richard Pauchek, who's now in uh, graduate school at Caltech. And uh, what he decided to do was to see if this drug, TMPYP4, which had been developed as a G quadruplex RNA binder, would prevent the formation of the RNA PRC2 complex biochemically in an in vitro experiment. And you can see that for a G quadruplex forming RNA, the drug at increasing concentrations inhibits formation of the binding interaction of PRC2, a control RNA that has exactly the same 50% A, 50% G composition, but no tracks of G, only alternating GAs, completely unaffected by three micromolar. Here's another G quadruplex forming A uh, RNA, a, a telomer, telomere RNA uh, inhibited by this drug, a control RNA with mixing up the, the order of the Gs uh, completely unaffected. Now, the cool thing about this drug is that it goes into living cells. And so we can look in living cells at whether uh, binding of TMPYP4 to G quadruplexes is inhibitory. And what we found for these six genes in a uh, chip qPCR experiment was that the adding the drug to the wild type cells phenocopied gave the same effect as the protein binding mutation in all cases. And for six control genes that were not where EZH2 occupancy was not perturbed by the RNA binding mutant. And you can look at the, the paper is now published in Nature Genetics. You can look this up. The control genes were not affected by, by the drug. So what is our model then? Uh, for how RNA, and this is a model, it's sort of a work in progress, right? I think it may still be, it still needs uh, maybe some testing, but I think we're starting to get a feeling of how RNA um, is affecting the recruitment of PRC2 to the human genome. This incorporates not just our own work, but those of many other researchers in the field. 
And so if you have a highly transcribed gene where PRC2 should not be active, there should not be epigenetic silencing, Pol2 is making lots of RNA and that RNA binds any incoming PRC2 molecules while it's bound Danny Reinberg and Jeannie Lee found that the PRC2 catalytic activity was inhibited, so it can do no damage at that moment. And Richard Jenner's lab and our lab found that that inhibition was due to the fact that you can't bind RNA and DNA at the same time. And so once it's bound to RNA, it can't dock on chromatin. So the RNA binding is mutually exclusive with the, with the DNA binding. Okay, so that keeps PRC2 from inappropriately silencing active genes. How about the maintenance of epigenetically silenced genes? Well, in those cases, what if there is an aberrant... Tom, time is running. Just today, sorry, time is running. Very good. This is, I think, my, my last slide um, that uh, the, uh, the RNA now uh, can recruit PRC2. Uh, it will, uh, if it can then be handed off to the, to the DNA, if it sees a pre-existing uh, H3K27 trimethyl mark, as Danny Reinberg has shown, that activates its catalytic activity. And so uh, in conclusion then, RNA is remarkably versatile. Non-coding RNAs outnumber messenger RNAs. They have many different functions. Neri Kim will be talking about the um, uh, microRNAs. Uh, RNA regulates epigenetic gene silencing in the nucleus. That does not have to be a non-coding RNA. It can be a pre-messenger RNA as well. Both of them are involved. And I would like to thank my laboratory for doing the work that allowed me to make this presentation this morning. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tom, for a fantastic talk. Um, I took lots of notes and there are lots of questions coming in, but we're going to move straight on to our next speaker and come back to the questions at the end. So thank you so much, Tom. And our next speaker is uh, Shuoha Shen, and um, she's professor at uh, Tsinghua University and the Center for Life Sciences in Beijing. So over to you and I will let you share your screen. Um, thank you, Edis, for your kind introduction. Before my, I start, I'd like to dedicate my talk to Qin Shen, a neurobiologist, a wonderful colleague, and a dear friend who passed away uh, two days ago. Um, so let me start. Um, I'd like to thank Ranwell and uh, Guangzhou for invitation. I'm really thrilled to present with my role models who have inspired me many years since graduate school. I'm a new kid in the field of RNA and chromatin biology and looking forward to your questions. So what is life? What genetic changes make us unique uh, um, human? How does a single somatic cell become a whole plant or animal? Um, why humans have so few genes? These are fundamental questions uh, yet to be answered despite tremendous information we have, um, we, we have gained in biology. My long-term interest is to understand how cell states are established de novo during development. However, I realized study protein coding genes is not enough to address this question because um, let's make a metaphor. Protein coding genes are just like islands in the ocean. And we, we have heard from Tom, uh, ENCODE uh, uh, project revealed that 75% um, of genomes are transcribed. Most transcripts are long coding only with unknown fun functions. Repetitive sequence was uh, regarded as a genomic parasite comprise half of the genome. I want to draw your attention to two subtypes of repeat, one called L1 and one B1. B1 also like called L, uh, ALU in human. They are most abundant subtypes of lie and sign retrotransposons. Together, they make up to 30% of human genome. This is quite remarkable as protein coding axons only accounts for a 2% of genome. So my lab has been taking a detour approach to investigate long coding portions of genome in fundamental aspects of transcription and chromatin regulation. We know our genome is highly packed in the nucleus and organized into euchromatin and heterochromatin, which are closely matched by high C defined AB compartments. 
This pattern of organization is evolution conserved for, from ciliates to humans in 500 million years. A euchromatin and a hydrochromatin social with distinct transcriptional activity and also differ in different features, including gene densities, histone marks, and the DNA replication timing. Although we have no chromatin compartmentalization for light years, the basic principle underlying genome folding remain unknown. Um, I want to know that most AB compartment uh, and a TAD seems to be invariant across mammalian cells, while sub-TAD loops are more variable for differential gene expression. This compartmental conservation suggests a fundamental principle that all cells stick to while coping with shifting signals in different states. We ask, could DNA sequences, particularly rep repetitive DNA, have a role in genome organization? Here shows you that uh, two type of sub-repeats B1, L1, I just mentioned, but not other uh, repeat subtypes and the random sequences, they appear to reside in exclusive compartments across the mouse genome. B1 rich U chromatin are depleted of L1 correlated with active chromatin and the transcription state, while L1 rich heterochromatin are depleted of B1. Um, for the sake of time, I can't show you all the data, but please trust me. And we found that B1 and LA1 repeat tends to inter interact with um, sequences with the same repeat type. We call it homotypic clustering. And the homotypic clustering of A1, B1 almost perfectly match the high C plate pattern. And the Lovo compartment coding based on A1, B1 ratio re reconstitute most of AB compartments. Consistent, as you can see here, DNA fish show the spatial segregation of L1 and B1. And, and this, is, this kind of um, uh, segregation is conserved in all cell types we analyzed. As you can see, um, B1 DNA adopt a central position in the nuclear interior, while L1 DNA exhibit highly organized signals that align the periphery of the nucleus and the nucleolus. This spatial segregation occurs dynamically, sorry, occurred dynamically during uh, early embryonic, de embryonic development and the cell cycle. And the L importantly, we show L1 RNA is essential for homotypic clustering and compartmentalization. Although we cannot rule out these repeat sequences are mere markers, we, the essentiality of L1 RNA prompters to propose L1 and B1 are the blueprint for the genome folding. So in this genetically encoded model, we propose L1 and B1 repeat organized chromatin microscopic structure at three levels. First, at the DNA level, the scattering of this repeat in the genome provide numerous recreation points to see the formation of, of uh, to see the formation of nuclear subdomains. Homotypic clustering of L1 or B1 rich regions initiate genome folding. And then at RNA level, repeat transcript, particularly as we demonstrate by L1 RNA, together with interacting proteins, may promote phase separation of individual subdomains and subsequent fusion and segregation of hydrochromatin and euchromatin. Certainly, this repeat sequence may be uh, attached anchored to nuclear uh, subnuclear structures such as nuclear speckles or nucleolus. Uh, which stabilize chromatin compartmentalization. In this model, there are two points I want to highlight. The structural information embedded in DNA is universally recognizable that's contributed to the stability and the conservation of compartments observed across many cells. Thus, DNA is rudimental compared to histone mark and the transcription. Another point I want to make is L1 and B1 compartments represent the structural and functional ground state of chromatin organization. On this common conserved core, dynamic gene regulation is overlaid. So talk about dynamic gene, extra, dynamic gene regulation, I have to mention uh, the effect of RNA. RNA is known as an integral component of chromatin. Um, compared to mRNA in cytosol, long coding RNA as a class preferential located to chromatin. One of the most important lessons I've learned in the past years from working in my lab and many others in the field show that uh, most short-lived link RNAs tends to act at their site 
to be transcribed to modulate nearby gene transcription and the chromatin state, this cis regulation of Lincoln A um, could be a general thing of mammalian gene regulation. Then comes the question how lung -code DNA is mobilized to the chromatin. We reported last year that U1 SNRP, a key component of spliceosome, target Lincoln A without eliciting a splice reaction and then mobilized on chromatin by interacting with polymerase 2. Most lung coding transcripts are short-lived and may only spread locally within their chromatin neighborhoods. Only a few stable abundant link -A's, such as the method one, exist long enough to be targeted to many other transgenomic sites. This model suggests chromatin-bound lung coding RNA may function as RNA group to hold polymerase machinery in the proximity of transcription site that's creating a reservoir of recruitment factors to feedback on transcription and chromatin state. So transcription involves assembly of large macromolecule complexes in a series of ordered events, including promoter bonding, initiation, pausing, and uh, productive elongation. The activity and the release of promoter post polymerase II is regulated through the phosphorylation of the carboxyl terminal domain, so-called CTD, in the largest subunit of PO2. CTD also serves as the landing pad for RNA processing factors during co-transcriptional RNA, pro uh, RNA um, processing. Imaging-based analysis have shown transcription onset is very inefficient, and, uh, it's, and the transcription is also intrinsically stochastic, does not occur continuously, but, uh, but rather occur in burst. This suggests a key regulatory event that are necessary to stabilize portal bonding for transcription elongation. Early work by Peter Cook and supported by many others in the field show that the transcription occur at a discrete site containing a number of polymerases, so-called transcription factory, or half or phase separate condensate. With, uh, this condensate show liquid-like properties that compatibilize polymerase for effective transcription. A phase separation model um, has been proposed to explain transcription processes. Recently, Ricky Young's lab showed that a low level of RNA um, promotes um, uh, transcription condensate formation, while high levels dissolves transcription condensate. However, the model of RNA in mediating, um, in, in mediating feedback regulation of transcription remains hypothetical because a uh, because of key link that, uh, that links um, RNA to the uh, transcription machinery that sh show characteristic DNA bonding activity is still missing. So now I'm going to switch gears talking about phase separation of RNA bonding protein um, in transcription control. Proteomic analysis uh, show that uh, RNA bonding protein comprise more than 60% of chromatin protein in mouse embryonic stem cells. Their bonding to chromatin are dynamically dependent on RNA and transcription. Here's are the chip seq analysis of some randomly picked RBP. You can see they show extensive co-localization with RNA polymerase at genomic hotspots, including promoters, enhancers, and super enhancers. Remark Although we only surveyed 14 RPPs, remarkably, 80% of protein coding gene promoters are bound by at least two RPPs, and 95% of super enhancers are co bound by over three RPPs. The degree of co bonding partially correlated with the level of mRNA expression. This observation suggests diverse RPP might act collaboratively on chromatin. And many um, people in the field, and we also show that RPP interact with, many RPP interact with polymerase in cells, and their lockdown need to reduce transcription. Next, I'm going to give you two examples. Hopefully, I can demonstrate direct effect of RPP in transcription control. The first example is a published story about WDR43. It's a ribosome biogenesis factor. Um, we found we use a improved chromatin-based clip method, we found for the first time that the promoter bound this sense and the anti-sense uh, RNA aborted transcript 
direct recruit and target WDI43, which you, we believe is the is the elongation factor to promote the release of PTFB and the transcription elongation. So um, could could uh, could this be a general effect of P in transcription control and how they interact with RNA and the biological evidence to prove that? Another example I'm going to give to you is about a classic RNA binding protein called the perispecial protein uh, PSPC1. Um, we utilize an auxin induced diagram system uh, to address a uh, direct effect. Um, effect of degradation of this protein. As you can see here, uh, rapid degradation of PSPC1 protein was detected at one hour of adding auxin analog IAA. And PSPC1 protein became barely detected at four hours. Interestingly, the protein levels of phosphorate polymerase 2 decreased dramatically, while pro uh, total level of PO2 is not affected. Consistent with early defect of PO2 phosphorylation levels, uh, ChIP-seq also showed reduced bonding of um, poised serine 5 PO2 and elongating 32 PO2, 32 PO2 uh, genome widely. And Im importantly, I want to note that uh, the this defect of PO2 bonding can be rescued by the full length PSPC1, but not by the mutant that lack either the RNA bonding activity or the act or the activity to phase separate, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Consistently, uh, transient transcriptome sequencing revealed global downregulation of latent transcription as early as three hours, and the, and the transcription activity remained low at the 24 hour of IA treatment. This result demonstrates a direct role for PSPC1 in modulating portal transcription in embryonic stem cells. To delineate sequential steps uh, through which PSP1 moderate transcription, we perform in vitro um, biochemical assay. Here, I, I'd like to introduce uh, TPP, the Tata box bonding protein, which is the first protein that bound to DNA to initiate a symbody of pre initiation complex and recruit polymerase 2. Recombinant TPP protein has weak phase separation activity, able to incorporate CT2 into its droplet. Thus, we regard TPP droplet as a surrogate for the more complex in vivo elucidation condensate. When we added RNA, as you can see, RNA evicts um, CTD from TPP droplet. Interestingly, when we add um, PSPC1 protein, you can see PSPC1 prevent RNA induced CTD eviction and the country dramatically enhanced the droplet size and the CTD incorporation into TPP condensate. And the next, uh, we performed the kinase assay to ask uh, the effect of RNA and uh, PSP, uh, PSPC1 on the CTD phosphorylation, because hyperphosphorylation of the um, portal CTD is required for its activity and release in cells. In this kinase assay, you see RNA alone has no effect low always effect on CTD phosphorylation. Well, adding PSPC1 protein, um, CTD phosphorylation uh, is dramatically increased, and this increase is further enhanced by addition of RNA. Well, um, PSPC1 protein lacked RNA bonding activity fair to show a synergistic effect. And we also found, result I'm not showing here, we also found that RNA synergized with PSPC1 in to enhance the release of phosphorated CTD uh, when uh, phosphorated CTD. And, and we sh I should note that the synergistic interplay between PSPC1 and RNA on CTD incorporation, phosphorylation, and the release is critical dependent on the phase separation and RNA bonding activity of PC PSPC1. Next, we ask how PSPC1 affect portiholo enzyme during in vitro transcription. We use the DNA template containing a heteroduplex bubble where um, in, uh, polymerase can bound to this single strand DNA within the bubble without help of general transcription factors. When we add NTP, uh, polymerase elongate and produce a full length run of transcript. When we omit GTP from NTP mix, 
um, polymerase pores at this triple C site to produce a GLS short transcripts. And we can monitor polymerase and DNA bonding with this uh, uh, gel shift assay show on the right. As you can see here, transcription lead to a gradual decrease of super shift DNA uh, polymerase and the DNA sig signals, which is consistent with the nuclear transcription where polymerase frequently fall off the transcription term template during promoter pausing and elongation. Interesting, adding P PSPC1 consistently enhanced PORT2 DNA signals in all conditions indicate PSPC1 directly promote polymerase 2 and DNA engagement during the initiation uh, loading and the subsequent pausing and elongation step. Um, I think I'm starting to run out of time and I, I'll quickly wrap, uh, wrap up because um, I want to know that both the RNA bonding and the phase separation activity are required to have this effect, enhancement effect of uh, RNA bonding protein um, um, polymerase bonding uh, to DNA template. So to summarize, we propose RBP stabilized polymerase engagement to the transcription site with RNA and the phase separation. We actually play that in cells. Phasal activity of PORT2 produces latent transcript which often evicts polymerase from gene promoter before CTT is properly phosphorated. When latent RNA recruit RBP, RBP uh, balance selective charge RNA to protect against precocious dissol dissolution of PORT2 condensate. RBP also make use of RNA as multivalent molecule to enhance polymerase, uh, polymerase incorporation during continuous round of polymerase falling off and rebounding, more RNA accumulates and RBP are recruit, recruited to form RBP-rich phase-separated transcription condensate. Once the threshold is reached, polymerase is hyperphosphorated and then released for effective elongation. So we, we think recruitment RBP to the transcription site contribute to the rate limiting step of polymerase condensate formation. And the, the advantage of deploying RBP as a class, as a new class of transcription regulator um, are, are obvious because the RBP are abundant. Um, they convenient localized to transcription site uh, because of co-transcriptional splicing. And RPP has this intrinsic biological property um, to bond on it, to phase separate. So we, we think RBP could be the main driving force to assemble transcription compensate and also leverage RNA production, uh, contribute to expression fine tuning and plasticity and the robustness. Uh, I want to make a brief comment that- Sorry, we should about... wrap up soon. Okay, uh, I'm all, almost ready. Transcription at a given site and the um, given site at given time in a cell um, could be pro um, probabilistic rather than deterministic. And there are so many new challenges we can, we can talk about, discuss about later. Um, um, so um, lastly, I want to say we are still far from understanding how self-aid is globally established during development, but at least maybe we could thinking of uh, start to step out of the box of mundane engine and to see what's as outside, outside the cave. Um, I want to thank people who contribute to this work. Um, without them, I couldn't make this uh, uh, presentation. And I also want to thank my uh, colleagues show here. Thank you all. Thank you very much. That was a lovely talk full of lots of information. Um, and we will come to the questions at the end, as I said earlier. And so without further ado, I want to introduce our next speaker. Um, so Shuohan, yes, okay, perfect. So. Professor Nari Kim, um, who is based in South Korea, at the Institute for Basic Science and so Seoul uh, National University. Nari, it's wonderful to, to have you and I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, uh, in this presentation, I will try to answer a simple question of what is what microRNA is and how we can define microRNA. 
So to give you a brief introduction, microRNA is a 22 nucleotide single-stranded RNA produced from hairpin-shaped precursor by RNAs3 enzymes. They often conserved, as you can see here, and associated with um, argonaut family protein. And through base pairing, they, they induce um, degradation and translation and repression of specific targets. Um, the microRNA pathway begins with uh, transcription by RNA polymerase II, uh, producing primary transcript by microRNA with a local hairpin structure. MicroRNA sequence is embedded in the upper part of the stem, so it requires a processing reaction mediated by microprocessor composed of Drosia, the RNA3 component, and DGCLA, uh, the uh, cofactor. This reaction releases a, a short hairpin structure called uh, pre-microRNA, which is exported by exporting 5 and cleaved by dicer again near the loop, uh, generating a microRNA duplex, which is for, uh, loaded onto argon family protein. And one strand is removed, another strand remains as the guide in the RNA silencing. Uh, through base pairing to the, the target messenger RNA, it, uh, it recruits multiple factors, facilitating the adenylation and uh, repressing uh, translation. This is uh, obviously a, a simplification. Uh, apart from this canonical pathway that is dependent on Drosia, exporting 5 and Dicer, there's, um, there are other multiple uh, ways to make a microRNA. So some microRNA, non-canonical microRNAs like neutrons or kept short hairpins, they, uh, uh, they bypass Drosia, they, they're independent to Drosia. Um, neutrons are generated from short introns through splicing. Kept short hairpins are uh, produced from direct uh, transcription and they can skip Drosia. Other abundant non-coding RNAs like tRNAs and SNOW RNAs, they sometimes take alternative conformation. So some of these can be uh, processed by a uh, dicer to produce mature microRNA. There's also um, an, a single example of dicer independent microRNA, MIR 451, uh, which uh, produces a short hairpin, which is too short to be processed by dicer. So they um, instead goes directly onto dice uh, argonaut and, and after cleavage and trimming, they can produce much of microRNA. So there are interesting ways to produce microRNAs in alternative uh, manner. But um, I need to emphasize here that uh, the canonical microRNAs actually account for more than 99% of the microRNA population in the cell in terms of the abundance. So non-canonical microRNAs with uh, a few exceptions like MIR-451 or uh, MIR-320A, they are very low in abundance. And most of them are very poor in conservation as well. So these observations um, uh, question the functional relevance of these non-canonical microRNAs. So um, so far in the microRNA registry near uh, base, which is mainly based on small RNA sequencing data, there are more than 1,800 microRNA loci annotated so far. Um, but um, it is unknown which one of these annotations are canonical or non-canonical. And perhaps more importantly, um, uh, it's not clear what fraction of these microRNAs are bona fide microRNAs and what are uh, false annotations. So um, to rephrase this question simply, uh, what is microRNA anyway? I mean, how can you define a microRNA? So um, uh, my lab and other labs in the field have been trying to um, answer this question uh, by various ways and found uh, some characteristic features of prime microRNAs. So in terms of structure, they have long stem that is about 35 base pairs uh, that can be divided into lower stem and upper stem relative to the uh, Drosia cleavage site. And this stem is surrounded by single-stranded basal segment and apical loop. Uh, additionally, there are few cis uh, sequencing moti sequence motifs, uh, such as UG at the basal junction, 
with matched GHG in the lower stem and UG UG motif in the at the uh, apical junction and C and NC in the three prime flanking region. But, uh, but the problem is that uh, most prime microRNAs lack one, of, uh, one or more of these elements. So it is difficult to use these elements to, to define a microRNA. So we decided to take uh, additional uh, experimental approaches, uh, firstly, by determining their uh, upon, uh, uh, de uh, dependence on biogenesis factors by uh, producing knockout on Drosia X protein five or Dicer. So with uh, Drosia knockout, uh, this is the abundance, relative abundance compared to parental cells, uh, two uh, independent replicates, and you can see that uh, the vast majority, in fact, more than ninety-five percent of microRNAs are strongly reduced and nicely separated from non-canonical microRNAs. Uh, but on it expectedly, um, uh, exporting five knockout, you can see only modest uh, decrease, indicating that exporting five is not an essential factor, although it is required for full expression. Um, what about Dicer? You can see a strong reduction for most of the microRNAs, but the effect is variable, and at least some microRNAs escape from uh, Dicer knockout. I won't go into details. But the bottom line here is that Drosia is the highly selective and critical gatekeeper for the canonical microRNA pathway. So what is Drosia? Let me explain a little bit about this complex. Uh, microprocessor complex is a trimary complex with one copy of Drosia and two copies of DGCLA. Drosia interacts with the uh, basal side of the hairpin. Uh, DGCL8 interacts with the upper part of the hairpin and stabilizes Drosia through the C terminus. Uh, recent studies have found several auxiliary cofactors less stably bound and not essential, but uh, still modulate uh, uh, prime microRNAs. We have served the structure of this complex uh, in collaboration with Che Song Wu's group. In this complex, we had uh, two thirds of the uh, Drosia protein that covers all the essential domains and DGCLA small part that is sufficient to stabilize Drosia. This structure shows that uh, Drosia takes an elongated shape with uh, two catalytic domains making an intramolecular dimer uh, with catalyzed uh, sites in, uh, at the interface. Um, and uh, the uh, central domain is co uh, connected with this long connector helix, uh, which is surrounded and supported by the flat platform domain. Um, and in fact, this structure is highly similar to uh, that of Dicer, which suggests the common evolutionary origin of Drosia and Dicer. Uh, DGCL8 uh, C terminus forms a nice helix and binds to the outer surface of the uh, double strand uh, RNA3 domain. Double strand RBD is sitting here. Uh, the linker seems flexible, so it would move in uh, when it binds to uh, the substrate. Together with biochemical data, uh, we could build a uh, model with the substrate where uh, Drosia is sitting at the basal side, recognizing UG and MGHG motif. Um, DGCL8 interacts with the rest of the stem uh, and recognize the UG UG motif. The CNNC motif is, is on this side, um, uh, and that would be recognized by the auxiliary factor. SRSF3, but it's not shown on this slide. Okay, so we have learned a lot about microRNAs and its biogenesis factors from these studies. But uh, since our studies were initially uh, based on uh, just a few microRNAs and their variants, we had limited understanding of uh, the microRNAs as a whole. Uh, so we had only, we didn't have a satisfying answer to this question yet. So we decided to take two additional approaches. For um, One approach is to perform CLIPSIC experiment. Uh, we used formaldehyde for cross-linking and sequenced the, the bound RNAs. Um, and uh, but we found that uh, this approach um, uh, captured the products of Drosia with the intact ends. So that allowed us to map 
the in vivo uh, drusha cleavage sites. And that was very useful and informative. But still, this analysis was, was uh, limited to uh, the microRNAs that I expressed in the cell types used for the experiment. So we took additional approach, complementary uh, approach. This time, this is an in vitro experiment uh, with high throughput sequencing. Uh, so we um, generated the one, uh, all the annotated human prime microRNAs by in vitro transcription and used this pool to do um, uh, in vitro processing with purified microprocessor and sequence the products. So from this experiment, as you'd expect, some microRNAs have uh, cleaved nicely to produce pre-microRNA. We, uh, we call this productive processing, but some other prime microRNAs, they were not processed or they were cleaved um, at uh, non-specific sites. So using this information, we could determine the cleavage efficiency and map the cleavage site simultaneously. Uh, the result from this study was uh, both expected as expected and, and surprising at the same time. So uh, in this plot, you can see the cleavage efficiency, which is the ratio of pre microRNA reads over input reads. On the y-axis, you have cleavage homogeneity, that is a fraction of the major cleavage site from a given hairpin. Uh, so if you compare Drusha, uh, microRNAs that are known to be Drusha dependent um, and uh, the, those that are known to be Drusha independent, the uh, uh, dark gray dots, uh, you can see that these two groups uh, separate from each other nicely. Uh, so uh, we could de determine the cutoffs um, uh, that uh, best separates these two control groups and, uh, and, and, and to define the microRNAs that can be processed very well. And uh, that uh, resulted in 560 productively processed microRNAs and, and uh, the rest, about 70% of these microRNAs failed in this assay. So what does that mean? So, um, so this failed uh, group uh, would obviously contain Drosia-independent microRNAs like myotrons uh, and those um, uh, that are falsely annotated. But as you can see here, some of the green dots that are um, Drosia-dependent canonical microRNAs, some of them uh, failed in this assay as well. And uh, that suggests that our in vitro uh, screen uh, assay is, uh, does not fully recapitulate the in vivo situation. Um, uh, to see some of the examples, we, we actually found some uh, unusual, very strange type of processing events we call uh, unproductive processing. Uh, one type is inverse processing where um, prime microRNA is cleaved at the upper stem in, uh, instead of lower stem, uh, indicating that Drusia is actually seeding in an inverse orientation. Another type is NIC processing, where a symmetric cleavage occurs. Um, so these two types of NIC uh, and inverse processing are quite frequent in vitro, at least for some prime microRNAs. But in fact, if you look at the f data or other data, um, this, uh, this uh, kind of um, unproductive processing seems rather rare in cells, in vivo. So what's, what's going on? Um, to cut the long story short, it turns out that SRSF3, one of the auxiliary factors of microprocessor, prevents unproductive processing through the uh, CNNC motif. So this is an example with CNNC motif, near 17. This one is undergoes NIC processing. Uh, without, uh, without SRSF3, uh, it uh, shows a strong NIC processing pattern without making much pre-microRNA. But if you add SRSF3, then NIC processing is reduced and pre-microRNA uh, production increases. If you uh, don't have CNNC motif in this mutant, uh, this effect is not seen. So um, uh, SRSF3 is, is a factor that can rescue this microRNA. You can expand this experiment by doing high throughput experiment. And uh, indeed, SRSF3 um, increased uh, many microRNA uh, cleavage efficiency and also homogeneity. So rescuing 201 microRNAs 
in total, 758 microRNAs are um, uh, produced, uh, processed productively from this experiment. So to summarize this part, uh, this current study provides an, a quantitative and, and comprehensive map of human prime microRNA processing sites. And out of the uh, one, over 1,800 prime microRNAs we tested, only 758 prime microRNAs were cleaved confidently by uh, Drosia. So, um, uh, and and um, uh, only 907 even with um, relaxed cutoffs. So um, only a fraction of microRNAs among the mirror-based annotated microRNAs can be um, a canonical microRNAs that depends on, uh, on Drosia. And the rest, uh, about half or even uh, more than half, are either non-canonical or false entries. And based on uh, the uh, conservation pattern and expression uh, levels, we believe that about uh, 700 microRNA entries in mirror base might be misannotated false entries um, that need to be reconsidered in the next version of mirror base. Uh, the mirror DB, another um, database which have been um, manually annotated by Bastian from, uh, seems to agree uh, uh, better with our uh, research. So the bottom line, the take home message here is that be careful, very careful to avoid um, uh, wasting your time on false annotations. If you are selecting a microRNA for a functional study, it can easily uh, cost a PhD time. So, um, and then we also uh, found a typical events such as alternative NIC and inverse processing and SRSF3 is a broad acting cofactor that modulate many canonical prime microRNAs by preventing uh, unproductive processing, promoting productive processing, and modulating alternative processing. As the last point, um, I, I want to touch upon some outstanding questions in the microRNA field. Uh, the the, the uh, microRNA studies so far have been focused on, uh, on microRNAs that are highly abundant conserved and, and those that are associated with cancer, uh, leaving hundreds of microRNAs with little or no functional data. So these microRNAs uh, need, it, it really deserve uh, some further uh, functional proper investigation. And some um, uh, microRNA uh, isomers from alternative processing they are quite abundant in some cases and they are regulated as well. So they also deserve additional uh, attention. And we will need to improve our experimental and computational tools to identify microRNA targets. I'm curious if there are uh, some missing factors or yet unknown non-canonical biogenesis pathways. Um, we will need to investigate further the interplays between microRNA factors and other um, factors. Um, the regulatory mechanisms, localization, and phase separation. Lastly, uh, we will have a, a need to have better understanding of microRNAs function in, in human pathology and uh, the potential of microRNAs as therapeutic tools and targets, and we will need to improve the siRNA design and delivery technologies. With that, I would like to uh, thank Kijun and Seungchan who did uh, the later part of the work and everyone at the IBS Center for RNA Research. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Nari, for a, love, a wonderful talk. Um, very, very didactic as well. <laughs> thank you. Um, so now I think we move to um, a 15 minute or maybe 10 minute discussion because I think we're running slightly late. So, um, so, so yeah, so I think um, as far as I'm concerned, the three talks really illustrate just how uh, vast and beautiful the uh, non-coding RNA world is. Um, so many different things that can be done with RNA. Um, you know, the impact on, on the way the genome is folded, the way it's regulated, the way chromatin um, maybe is organized. So I just wanted to maybe uh, kick off with a few questions for between the, the three speakers um, about, you know, how, how can we really tease apart the, the different 
non-coding functions of non-coding RNA. Um, we heard that, you know, they can be involved in phase separation, they can be involved in, in chromatin. And um, as someone who works on a non-coding RNA myself exists, it's taken decades and we still don't quite know um, what it does. So um, I was just thinking whether maybe each of you had some thoughts about what the, you know, the next frontiers are in trying to tease about function and get to mechanism of these RNAs. Uh, and of course, this is at many levels. It can be at the biochemical, genetic, or, or other level. So maybe I could start with Nari. If she was the last one to speak, maybe you can be the first one to, right. to say a few words. I, I guess I can speak only for microRNAs and, <laughs> and the other who I can uh, answer about the longer and, and more diverse ones. Um, uh, microRNAs, uh, I think we, we have tools um, uh, that are relatively good, uh, but we will uh, uh, need to improve the, our research tools like uh, microRNA target identification methods. Um, and um, also someone will need to do um, uh, extensive genetic uh, studies, uh, which have been done for, for some conserved microRNAs, but for less conserved ones, nobody has really uh, done serious work on those. So, um, so genetics and um, microRNA target identification, those were, uh, two approaches will be key to the next stage to understand the functions of microRNAs. But as you said, there are, you know, there are hundreds where we have very little idea of their function. And so, you know, do you think some of them just don't have a function? That seems highly unlikely given how specific they, their structures are, et cetera. But how are you right. going to fish out their function? Um, mm. Right, right. So, uh, well, uh, th th if I need to prioritize uh, the microRNAs, uh, I will definitely, uh, focus on those that are uh, conserved in vertebrates uh, or in at least right. in mammals, uh, and then go down to to look at less conserved ones and yet uh, express that relatively high uh, concentration. Um, yeah. Yes, I think that's a very interesting um, debate as well about whether conservation should be indeed the the way to to choose the most relevant ones, or in some cases, especially for the long non-coding RNAs, it's often the less conserved ones that have evolved to do something very specific. And I mean, you know, when I look at exist, it's not really that conserved anywhere other than you know, the central right, panel. True. So it's, it's really that's interesting. That's very true, but if you, if you have it's hundreds true. of candidates to look at and you have you limited exactly. resources, then, then you have to choose anyway. Yes. So maybe, um, Tom, I could ask you then the question about, you know, how do you tease function out of all of this? And in, in your case, of course, um, the, you know, some of the key questions are about how PLC2 is dealing with its, both its chromatin DNA binding and its RNA binding. Um, you know, how, how are you going to tease apart what, what's doing what and, and whether there are some default mechanisms or something active going on? I think it's I think it's difficult, Edith, to um, for many of the experiments that we do and that the field does uh, involve knockouts, and then and then there's you don't you don't just see the primary effect of the RNA, you see the secondary effects, and you see the the a, a whole network of interactions that has been perturbed, and. Uh, I think that some of the newer techniques, such as instead of using RNA-seq, to use GrowSeq or other more instantaneous measures of transcription, um, I think those are perhaps important and need to be used more. Um, but and the uh, and then in in the case of PRC2, you know, if you just what, what most of these papers do is they they do a genome-wide or transcriptome-wide analysis and they see a thousand RNAs changing and they just pick one and yeah. they that has a cute name or that is you know sort of an outlier and then they knock that one out and they see some kind of an effect but it's really the ensemble of all of these interactions that is related to the biology and that's very difficult to to um 
to get into. So I'm I'm thinking we're not very close to understanding mm -hmm. uh, how epigenetic silencing is is really regulated. Yeah, and I think I mean what you say is very true. To what we do, you know, knockouts. You go in and you knock out, and you're not actually sure whether you know, the phenotype you see is due to the RNA that you've disturbed or to the DNA element you've disturbed. And I mean, we've come across cases where, you know, it is actually just the DNA that matters. The non-coding RNA doesn't seem to be, you know, the one that's doing anything. And then in other cases, it's very much the non-coding RNA. So, so, but I still feel like we're, we're kind of missing some, some technologies that would allow us to capture more of what RNA function is doing. And that's the problem with RNA biology. You know, technically it's much more difficult than genome biology, right? Um, there's so much more going on, the folding, the structure, the, 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 the stability or lack of. And I was just maybe one last question on this topic, Tom. I mean, you know, catalytic RNA obviously um, is, is something that, that you know very, very well. So what, how many, how many of these non-coding RNAs do you think might have a cryptic catalytic activity that people haven't um, looked at yet? What a, what a great question. And, and of, of course, I hope that many of them might. But, but the truth is that, that, that we don't know because the, the way that um, our lab and the Sid Altman's lab found the catalytic RNAs is we were following a process not you know, not looking for RNA catalysis. We're following a reaction, and then at the end of the reaction, um, uh, there was just only the RNA that was doing the catalysis, and and so I think there are a lot of reactions in cells that 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 could be catalyzed by RNA, but no one has uh, no one has an assay for them, or no one has really looked at that at that level. Um, the interesting, the, just one final comment. The interesting thing about link RNAs, and some of the students ask these questions about, you know, these small micropeptides. I think it's a yes. mistake to think that a link RNA is doing only one thing. If a link RNA is five kilobases, there's plenty of space for it to have a catalytic element of a hundred nucleotides, a uh, aptamer element of a hundred nucleotides, a um, uh, it, it, uh, it could sequester microRNAs and sponge them up, and it could, um, you know, yeah, exactly. All the, you know, the one RNA, and it, and it could encode a micropeptide, and these are not mutually exclusive functions. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to stop thinking of there being a function for a link RNA and start thinking that there might be uh, a list of functions for each of these. 300,000 link RNAs. Yeah. It's daunting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Frightening. But good for the students because they'll have plenty to do. Um, but so maybe. Absolutely. There's lots of work there. Um, so maybe, Shoha, I can ask you a little bit about um, one of the, you know, the topics that you touched on, obviously, was um, the act of transcription. Um, and so here, there's a lot of interest indeed in how <coughs> phase separation uh, could be involved. And I think, you know, your talk very nicely illustrated that. So, but to what extent do you think it's going to be a sort of common process that maybe transcription factors and RNA binding proteins um, are actually involved in transcription control and that phase separation is, is a mechanism for this? I know it's a hot topic. Um, and some people love it, some people hate it. But so what's your gut feeling? Is it going to be the, the rule or is it going to be occasional exceptions? Yeah. Um, <coughs> my, my gut feeling is phase separation is going to involve every process in the cell, in the liquids uh, in the cell. Uh, uh, Larry, probably including microRNA processing, as you showed, the SRF3 also involved in the um, uh, reg uh, modulate drug cell activity as it may be phase separation also involved in that uh, microRNA processing. So, um, so, so when we started working on RBP, this, the, 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 the crew leaders are working on RBP because the RNA, the RNA is an integral component of chromatin. So RNA uh, ha uh, have to enlist RNA binding protein for, um, for its function. Um, and the RBP is so abundantly present 
um, when we think about transcription, or we, we think about transcription factors. Um, so, but, but the thing is, in, in, in a cell, in a cell, the transcription factors as a protein always there, but it bonding to chromatin is very dynamic. So we, we, we should think what's the role of transcription factor versus RNA bonding protein. I think transcription factor, initial bonding to chromatin, like a pioneer factors, maybe open up the chromatin uh, structure, allow RNA polymerase to access the transcription site and afterwards, and then that leave the job to RNA RBP. So you, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. so, uh, so, uh, so the transcription, it's like the, the, the rate limiting step uh, is no longer transcription factor. It's uh, transfer already open the common side. Then the RBP formation of RBP reach tr transcription condensate, able to effectively compartmentalize polymerase and lastly enzymes such as kinase CDK7, CDK9. And then once the threshold is reached and then the transcription can be fired and fire the transcription. So that's why we observe transcription burst in, in cells. Okay, yep. so that position RBP in a position that is essential for this process. But the question is, the problem is that there are hundreds of RBPs are found detected on chromatin. So at a, at a single locus, how many RPPs participate in this event? Because we did a cheap seek analysis. We only analyzed 14 uh, RPPs and we showed they bound extensively um, at the same genomic site. So in that genomic site cannot fit all these RPPs. So we, we think RPP does not directly bound to the DNA. Instead, they present in a phase separated condensate interact with polymerase, moderate the transcription condensate. And the transcription condensate, it's like, a, um, you can say like a balloon, RNA like air to blow into the balloon. Once it reaches a certain side, the balloon explodes and the transcription fire. So that's, that's my view of RBP in transcription. I think we'll, uh, we'll all go away with that image of this balloon and uh, <laughs> RBP uh, at the center of it. So. Okay, well, so I think we should probably move to some questions and answers um, from the audience because otherwise, uh, you know, there are lots of questions and I, and I think maybe we should take a couple. Um, I guess um, some of them you can all answer in your, uh, in your, at your leisure later, but maybe there's one I, I can see that came in actually from an anonymous, anonymous attendee. So this is for, for Nari, actually, um, it's a good question. I'd never thought of this about, so since there are so many primary microRNAs that um, uh, ex exiting the nucleus, how they have to compete for Drosha, for cleavage, and how does Drosha decide which ones it goes for first and which ones it, you know, it goes for later? Is there, is there some kind of hi hierarchy? Mm, uh, or, the processing efficiency in vitro um, uh, seem to um, roughly correlate with the uh, uh, processing efficiency in vivo uh, ba uh, based on the um, F-clipsic data and, and uh, small rna -seq data. So, uh, the, so the intrinsic affinity to the prime microRNA and uh, the optimality of the structure and sequence, they seem to uh, be the primary determinants for the um, uh, speed or kinetics of the uh, uh, the processing and interaction in, in vivo. and. Uh, uh, but there may be RNA binding proteins that are in close proximity to the uh, primary microRNA hairpin, so th they, they may also uh, influence the interaction between prime microRNA hairpin and, and um, uh, microprocessor. I see. Huh. Wonderful. Um, Tom, maybe I could ask you a question. The, um, there are many, many, but um, there's one that comes up a little bit in different ways about the G quadruplex um, structures. And so one question is what proportion of RNAs actually has a G quadruplex structure and, and, and could potentially then be regulated by PLC2? And, and that's Eric Zhao. And then I think Junji Liu actually makes the point that there aren't that many G quadruplexes. And so how could 
then you know this be a major adapter for PLC2. So maybe you want to say a little bit more about that. Yes, well, the work from Junchi and the Bartel lab um, showed that that you know there are probably some unidentified helicases that are always unwinding these. So it's sort of a race that they're thermodynamically very stable. So they fold, they fold. That's that's inevitable. But then they are either bound by PRC2, or if the helicase gets there first, they're unfolded for a while, and they refold. And so it's it's all it's a dynamic situation. Uh, we don't. Um, one thing that that one approach that people have taken, such as Shankar Balasubramanian at, in Cambridge, is to predict uh, bioinformatically how many there could be. Uh, you get a huge number uh, when you when you actually look for the signature. But of course, that could be an overestimate because you don't know that all of those actually form. So I think that. Uh, the approach we're going to take in the future is to start looking at specific link RNAs that have a lot of potential to form G quadruplex and just see to what extent they really do um, form those structures and interact with PRC2 uh, in cells. Okay. I'd be uh, interested to see what you find if you look at EXIST, for example. <laughs> I'm staying away from EXIST. For political reasons. <laughs> oh, what <a> <laughs> okay. Um, and then maybe another question quickly for you, Tom, uh, that came in from uh, Alberto Comblet, where he's asking whether you've made knockout mice for the RNA binding sequence in PLC2 and what the phenotype there is. We have not. Okay. So something on the to do list then, probably. Um, maybe not for me. So, I... um, <laughs> it's easy. These days it's easy to make a knockout. So it, it was more difficult to analyze it, but. Um, well, I think um, it's going to, I think it's going to be embryonic lethal. Yeah. Yeah. But it, you could, I guess, make a, a conditional and, and look at, at in very specific uh, contexts, but that would be a, a neat experiment to do. Um, and then maybe a question for, for Xiaohua um, about RBPs and basically, um, I think this was a question from, ah, again, from Junji Liu, I think. Um, why, why use total RNA? Is there any RNA sequence specificity or any RNA modifications that, that seem to be required for phase separation? Um, uh, that's a very good question. So uh, first, regarding sequence specificity, um, so we, we test a different, um, we, we use a total RNA in the assay, but we also test a different RNAs uh, synthesized in vitro by in vitro transcription. And in, in our case, we don't see uh, obvious specificity um, in this system. Um, but in general, um, RNA bounding protein bounding to RNA, the specificity is much weaker compared to transcription factor bound to uh, consensus DNA site, but this weak uh, RNA RBP interactions, but I think that contribute would tremendously in the phase separation event in vivo. Uh, and regarding the so 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 um so I think uh, RNA evict CTT uh, from the phase separated uh, TPB droplet most likely because the negative charge on the RNA uh, that uh, break the hydrophobic interactions and RPP neutralize this negative charge. And the, the second part is RNA modification, whether the RNA modification in volume phase separation. Um, I, surely, I think it will, for example, M6A modification. And um, there's also um, already have a, um, uh, um, I, I think it should be tested in the future. Thank you, Jinju, for the question. I'm sure it will be, absolutely. So, um, so I think we've come to the end of our question time. Maybe I, I can end with a quote from one, one of the, it wasn't a question, more a statement by um, Jag Canwell. Seems like non-coding RNAs represent the dark matter of the nucleus. Um, I would agree, but I guess, you know, matter only stays dark until you shine light on it. And I think our three speakers today shone some light on the dark matter of the nucleus. So I want to thank the three of you for doing an excellent job. Um, and the audience, uh, who was very, very numerous in participating. 
And I think now we will move to um, a meet the panelist um, session and I will let Janine take over. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much, um, Edith. Before we close out this portion of the event, I just want to remind everybody uh, and especially the trainees really to stay on the call for another 20 minutes uh, for a special meet the panelist session. Um, but I also want to say um, Edith, Tom, Nari, and Xiao Hua, thank you so much for being here today, sharing your science and contributing to a really, um, really great discussion. Um, uh, we really appreciate having you. And thank you so much to the audience for joining. Um, we welcome your feedback. Please take a minute to complete the brief survey that I've dropped into the chat box. Um, and hopefully we will see you again on July 7th for our next Life Science Across the Globe event which will focus on the theme of origins of humans and culture and will be hosted by NCBS in Bangalore. So we very much look forward to that on July 7th. And at this time, we invite our trainees, our students and postdocs and anyone else um, in training positions who is not running um, an independent group or laboratory to stay on the call for, uh, to, to ask some questions of our esteemed panelists and hear more of what they have to say in the realm of um, career development and training.